Thank you for watching, who's ever watching. Um, yeah, so uh, at the end of uh, the lecture this morning, I, I, I presented uh, some topics in irreversible aggregation. I started with constant kernel aggregation um, and derived the generating function solution. Then I turned to deriving a scaling solution, which in some sense is the most general way to deal with problems which are sufficiently complicated that you don't know even how to start. And what I want to do today is show you the generating function solution for the product kernel aggregation, which is one of the classic exactly soluble models. The solution is very elegant and very pretty, and it's a little bit advanced, so I hope that I'm not going to blow anyone's mind here, but it's just, it's, it's just so beautiful, it's, it's worth trying to show. So we're talking about product kernel aggregation. And that is where the reaction rate between a cluster of mass i and mass j is equal to i times j. And one way one can motivate this uh, reaction rate is you say that we're dealing with, say, molecules that are multifunctional units. And so when, and there's like k, uh, you know, for a cluster of size i, there's i functional units. And when an i and a j come together, you know, because there's like i grabby hands from one guy and j grabby hands from another guy, the rate at which they'll actually react is proportional to ij. <clears throat> and so we want to try and understand the dynamics of this process. So let me write down the, master uh, the rate equation for the concentration of clusters of mass k. So this is equal to 1 half summation i plus j is equal to k i c i J C J minus uh, K C K, and the other term here, I C I summed over all I. By definition, that's equal to one because just that's just the the total mass in the system, which we can set equal to one. So I want to solve this set of equations, and so the natural thing is to try the generating function. Now here, uh, there's a few almost. Um, preliminaries that one should do to try and simplify the algebra. So uh, first thing is that you see that there's an i and there's a j sitting out in front here. There's a k sitting out in front here, which normally would appear by differentiating the generating function with respect to its argument. So, you know, if you didn't know any better and you just tried to do the original generating function, you would see after you went through some of the steps that you said, oh, geez, it would have been a lot simpler if instead of doing the generating function per se, I introduce a slightly different generating function. So let me call g of yt is equal to summation over all k, k times ck times zk. So I, 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 it just turns out to be convenient to put a k out in front. But then, well, there's a z, there's a y. What did I do here? And so another point is that because I'm doing differentiation, and if I were differentiating with respect to z, you know, there would be like one less power of k of z here, and it's a little bit clumsy to deal with it. So it turns out that it would be better to instead not use z, but use e to the y. So I'm going to put it here to the yk. So that's the generating function I'm going to use. So it, it, you know, uh, conceptually, it's no different than before. It's just that now I'm saying that z is e to the y, and I'm using y as my basic variable. And I put a k out in front for convenience. And you'll see, let's, let's work it out, and you'll see that it just makes a much simpler equation. OK, so I'm going to take my original equation. I'm going to multiply by k, e to the y k, and I'm going to sum over all k. And let's see what comes out. So on the left-hand side, I just have the time derivative of the generating function. So I have g t. So again, I'm going to use subscripts to denote partial differentiation with respect to t. Um, here, let me put a little worksheet over here. So I have i j, and then I have i plus j, c i c j. And so um, uh, let's see what I have here. And then I have times e to the y i, e to the y, e to the y j, because I have e to the y k, but k is equal to i plus j. Okay, so let's see what we can do with this. So um, 
there's, there's two terms, and so there's a term which is like I squared, you know, I, I squared J, C I, C J, E to the Y, I, E to the Y, J. And so the J, C J, E to the Y, J is a generating function. The term I squared, C I, E to the Y, I is just a generating function differentiated with respect to Y one time. And that's why I use um, e to the yk, because it involves derivatives, and I don't have to worry about losing a power. So the very first term, and then there's a one-half here that's going to cancel the fact that there are two identical such terms here with i and j interchange. So I have g times dg dy times 2 and the half, and so I'm going to get here uh, g dg dy. So that's the first term. In the second term, so I have k squared ck e to the yk. So that's the derivative of the generating function with respect to y. It just brings down one more factor of k. So this is just minus gy. So I get, um, <coughs> so I'm going to get gy, g, g minus 1. And so if you stare at this for a second, if there wasn't this, this is just the good old linear wave equation. Now it's a linear wave equation, but with a velocity that depends on the amplitude of the wave. So it's a nonlinear wave equation. And in fact, it's the Berger's, Berger's equation in disguise. So the fact that it's a nonlinear wave equation means that typically you have wave breaking phenomena. And it turns out that the gelation transition corresponds to this wave actually breaking. So that's one point. Second point is now we want to solve this equation. And, um, you know, again, it's like one of these things that um, it's a first order partial differential equation. It's soluble by the method of characteristics. And if you haven't seen method of characteristics, it looks mysterious, but it's like something that any sort of math major will, will take. And it's very simple in principle. So let me rewrite this equation as GT. Actually, let me be really pedantic. I'll write it as GDT plus 1 minus G dg dy is equal to zero. <clears throat> but let me also write this as dg, the total derivative gt. And so if I do it this way, then I can also write this as, let me go back up over here. So this I can write as dg, because this is g as a function of y and t. So I can write this as dg by dt. plus um, dg by dy, dy by dt equals zero. So the point here is that g is a, fun is a two variable function of y and t. It satisfies this partial differential equation. I can think of it as a total time derivative. If I understand, you know, if I, when I compute the total time derivative, I just get the partial time derivative plus the part that involves the derivative with respect to y. So the point is that on what's called a characteristic curve. Um, so on the curve where, um, uh, so, so on the curve, dy by dt is equal to 1 minus g. So if dy dt is 1 minus g, then this equation is the same as what we had before. And the curve is, g is constant. So on this curve, keep looking for my brush. Um, on this curve, uh, g equals constant. So, um, you know, this is very similar to what we saw in the case of the linear wave equation that you had that the, the function you had to solve for was some very simple function that you would match to initial condition. Here we have more or less the same kind of uh, situation uh, occurring. So, um, what we have is that on this curve, g is constant. So we can integrate this equation and get y of t is equal to 1 minus g t plus some constant. And let me call that f. And so in particular, at t equals 0, y at t equals 0 is just equal to f. And now we match that to the initial condition. And once we do that, then we can work this out and, compute and solve for the generating function. 
So initially, um, our generating function, so at t equals 0, g of y and t equals 0, and again, for the monomer only initial condition. So if there's only monomers, then this sum at t equals 0 is just one term, 1 c1 um, e to the y. Is there something wrong with the... Right. Because you see that over here, um, if, if this is true, dy dt is 1 minus g, so then the, that's the equation dg dt plus 1 minus g. Yeah, and by definition that was equal to 0, so it's constant. So anyways, so uh, for the monomer only initial condition, we have, you know, c1 is equal to 1, so we have 1, c1, that's 1, e to the y, so this is e to the y. So, at t equals 0, y is equal to log g. So finally, y of t at any time is equal to 1 minus g t plus log g. So, you know, it looks like I haven't, you know, it looks like I'm just going around in a circle, but this is actually the solution to the problem. So let's exponentiate this. So we'll get e to the y is equal to g times e to the 1 minus g t. Or um, g e to the minus g is equal to e to the y minus t. Uh, e g t here. So this is an implicit uh, solution for the generating function. So the thing is that you know, we have this complicated function of g is like, a, is like some function of time. And so, in some sense, we have time as a function of the generating function. But what we want is the generating function as a function of time. So we want to do something with this and invert this series or invert this function to figure out g as a function of time. And this is where the black magic comes in. Anyways, let me just do one more step here, which is let's call this gt is e times e to the minus gt. So it's all involving gt. It's equal to t e to the y minus t. And let me call this thing x. And so then we have the equation that x e to the minus x, and let me call all this stuff here equal to y, equal y. So we have y as a function of x, but what we want is x as a function of y. If I could invert this, turn this function inside out, then I'd have the solution to the problem. But in fact, we don't need to turn the entire function inside out. Um, we just, because g is, is, you know, what we really want is the term, the power series representation of g. So we only want not the full function x, but we just want its power series representation. And so how do we do something with that? And I keep losing my rags. So um, let's do something with that. <clears throat> And so there's something, and so the black magic here is something called the Lagrange inversion formula. And um, if you haven't seen it, it's so beautiful. You know, it's just every time I see it, like I'm always in awe of just like the wonders of complex analysis. So what we want, the power series, um, and by the way, I just want to check that my notation agrees with what I have here so I won't confuse myself. So <laughs> I, I managed to do something exactly backwards compared to my notes. I'm going to call this thing y, I, and I'm going to call this thing x. Sorry about this. If I do it the other way around, then I'll get halfway through it. I'll get myself confused. Okay, so I have x is a function of y, what I want is a y is a function of x. So we want the power series for y of x. And so this is going to be some power series a n x to the n. Summation n equals, you know, 1 to infinity. So how do we formally compute the power series? Well, we'd say, well, if I want the nth term here, what I can do is convert this from a power series to a Laurent series by dividing through by x to the n plus 1 and doing a contra integral. So a n is equal to 1 over 2 pi i 
a contra-integral of y divided by x to the n plus 1 dx. But y is this thing that we don't know. But now here comes the black magic. And it's incredibly simple but very powerful. Which, let's do the following. Let's convert this integral in the complex x plane to an integral in the complex y plane by just doing this, dx dy dy. And so let's see what we get. So this is 1 over 2 pi i, the contra integral. OK. Um, <clears throat> so x, we know what it is. So we have here y divided by x to the n plus 1. So that's y to the n plus 1 uh, e to the minus n plus 1 y. And dx dy, well, I don't know what that is, but I know what, because I have, um, or, or yeah, I do know it. So let's compute now dx by dy. So that's going to be, so that derivative is e to the minus y out in front. And when I differentiate with respect to x, there's one term which is just 1 and another term, I'm sorry, there's a, a term with y and a term with a minus, try again, dx by dy. I can differentiate the y and get a 1, or I differentiate up here and I get a minus y. So there's a 1 minus y. So I just converted the integral in x to an integral in y. Um, so let's see what else I can do with this. Um, so, uh, almost done. So what we're going to get then is that a n is equal to 1 over 2 pi i integral. So I have, so this cancels one of these guys. So I'm going to get 1 minus y. And then this cancels one of these guys. And then I have divided by y to the n. Um, and then I have e to the n y dy. And once again, what I want is the, um, uh, the, you know, this is now the nth term in the power series representation of the function. By the way, one other point I should mention is that notice that for y and x both very small, I can forget about this, so for small y or small x, y and x are the same thing. And because I'm doing the integral around a small circle about the origin, because x and y are linear functions of each other, I don't do any violence to this integral by changing variables from x to y, because for x and y going to zero, they're both the same variable. So I didn't do any violence by this, uh, by this change of variables. But the thing is that this function is now sufficiently simple that to evaluate its residue, I don't need to do any integration. I can just forget about it, about doing the Connor integral, and I just evaluate the residue directly from here. So um, what I would say then is a n is equal to the residue of the following thing. So I have um, 1 over y to the n minus 1 over y to the n minus 1. And then here, th this has a simple power series representation. This is a summation from k equals 0 to infinity of uh, n y to the power k over k factorial. So to find uh, the residue, I just have to find um, the coefficients of like uh, 1 over, uh, you know, y to the n plus 1. So this is equal to, and so what I'm going to get here is that for this guy, I want uh, the term n minus 1 will combine with this to give me a term which is of order, um, give me a term of order, you know, a residue. So there's going to be one term which is like uh, when k is equal to n minus 1. So it's n to the one, n to the n minus 1 over n minus 1 factorial. And then this guy's going to give me uh, n to the n minus 2 over n minus 2 factorial. So that's, and then this. And now allow me, because this is the kind of thing I suck at, um, let me just um, 
tell you that this has a very simple thing here. This is just equal to n to the n minus 1 over n factorial. Trust me that that's correct. So finally, y, which is equal to gt. So again, we were stuck here. We had gt was, you know, like here. But now we have solved for y as a function of x, or at least found its power series representation. This is the coefficient in the power series representation. So this is equal to summation a n x to the power n. So this is equal to, um, so let me write it. Actually, let me write it as a summation a k x to the power k. k equals 1 to infinity. And so what I get is, so there's this k to the k minus 1 over k factorial. And then I have x, which is this guy here. So it's going to be t to the power k minus 1, e to the minus, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, there's also, there's, I have to multiply by t. So there's a t to the k minus 1, but then there's t to the k. And then I have, um, in the exponent, e to the uh, k y, uh, e to the plus, uh, sorry, e to the, e to the ky, e to the minus kt. So that is my generating function. And this part, and one power of k is, oh, I erased it, crap. In the definition of the generating function, remember that it was like c k c k e to the y k. So I take the cof if I take get rid of the e to the y k divide by one power of k, then I have the concentration. So the final concentration of c k is equal to k to the power of k minus two over k factorial t to the k e to the minus k t. So that's the final answer. Above, so the sure. n uh, to the n minus 1 divided by n minus 1 factorial minus Here. n to the n minus 2. So apparently that is n uh, to the n minus 2 divided by n factorial. Or, 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 Where? Sort of going uh, from here to here? Yeah. So, uh, no, the down, down. Here? Yeah, that, that one, yes. Okay. So because if you take the second term and multiply by n minus 1 factorial, then... Uh, Oh, no, okay, okay. Yeah. okay. I mean, it's yeah. again, it's like, it looks yes. confusing, and every time, I, it takes me three times to get it right. Okay. But no, it, no, it's, it, it's okay. Yeah, okay. So anyways, that's the cluster size distribution. So again, um, there's nothing here that's in, in, like technically very difficult, but it's just that there's some con concepts here which are probably unfamiliar to the average uh, student, but it's just that some of these methods are so beautiful, I just wanted to like expose them. Okay. So now that we have the um, solution, we can ask, well, let's do something with it. Let's extract some physics out of all of this. And so let's look at this thing. So we have CK is equal to K to the K minus 2 over K factorial uh, T to the power K E to the minus KT. And so typically what we're interested in is um, in the limit of large k. We like to look at the asymptotic form of the cluster size distribution. So asymptotically, I'd say, well, let's use Stirling's approximation and get rid of k factorial in, for analytic functions. So k factorial is nothing more than k over e to the power k times square root of 2 pi k. So we have k to the k minus 2, k over e to the power k times square root of 2 pi k. That's Stirling's approximation t to the k, e to the minus kt. By the way, I'm using the last piece of Japanese chalk that was on the chalk trough, but it's like disappearing, so something is going to happen to my lecturing style very quickly. So anyways, I have here square root of 1 over 2 pi. There's, so k to the k, that cancels this, and then there's k to the minus 2 with a root k, so there's a 1 over k to the power 5 halves. And then I have... Um, 
t to the power k, e to the minus. So I have k t, and then there's one more uh, uh, e to the k here. So it's e to the minus k t minus 1. Um, and now the other thing is, now what we need to do is ask, so how does this function, this is the large k form of the distribution, how does this vary as a function of time? So we want to look at what's happening uh, as a function of time. So let me do one more step here. 1 over the square root of 2 pi, uh, 1 over k to the 5 halves. And then I have e to the minus. Uh, so what have I got here? Um, so I've got um, minus k t um, plus k minus k log t. Uh, and so what's interesting is that if you stare at this for a second, first of all, notice that when t is equal to 1, when t is equal to 1, this is 0, this is 0, so e to the 1. So at t equals 1, this is a power law decay for all k. Um, whereas for small times, it's, uh, there's an exponential here, and so there's an exponential, and to figure out the asymptotics of this exponential, let's suppose, let's look at, uh, assume, or let's try, t is equal to 1 minus epsilon. Because we know that when t is equal to 1, the exponential goes away and it's a pure power law. So let's look close to this point. And then um, what I have here is um, minus kt plus k minus k log t is equal to minus k. So t is 1 minus epsilon plus k minus k and then log t. So that's log of 1 minus epsilon. So it's minus epsilon plus epsilon squared, uh, sorry, t. Let's get this straight. So here I'm going to write, uh, no, I guess that's fine. Everything, I, I was, everything is fine. So log t. So logarithm of 1 minus epsilon. So it's minus epsilon minus epsilon squared over 2 dot, 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 dot. Yep. Ask you have uh, so plus k and then minus k log t. Plus k. My plus k and oh. then minus k log Thank t. Thank you. Thank you. Try. Let me try this again. Plus k and minus k log t. And so this will this will make look a little bit better. So it's minus epsilon minus epsilon squared over two. Um, okay. So uh, this k cancels that k. Plus k epsilon cancels this. Uh, uh, it seemed to have a sign mistake somewhere. Okay. No, I sorry. So this is th this is fine because minus minus is, makes a plus. Which is plus k. Here. Uh, I should put plus kt here? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. And minus k. Yeah. I mean, this is the kind of thing I really am terrible at. So anyways, trust me that everything cancels out except for the term minus k epsilon squared over 2. So the point is that this distribution asymptotically looks like k to the minus 5 halves for t equals 1, and for t less than but approaching 1, this is k to the minus 5 halves, e to the minus uh, k over 2, and epsilon is 1 minus t squared. So this is the exponential decay, and uh, we can um, rewrite this as, you know, I've got to start with a bigger piece of chalk. This is not working anymore. So it's k to the minus 5 over 2, e to the minus k over k star, 
where this characteristic size k star is equal to 2 over 1 minus t quantity squared. So this is the main result of this product kernel aggregation process that indeed the cluster size distribution is a power law um, at t equals 1 and for t less than 1 it's a power law with an exponential cutoff. And if you remember from earlier the previous lecture I showed, uh, I argued that for um, type 1 kernels, which is where large, large interactions are dominant, which is what happens in product kernel ag aggregation, that the cluster mass distribution, well, I plot it, CK as a function of K, so let's plot log of this thing. So it's a straight line, and here there's a cutoff, an exponential cutoff at a K star, which is proportional to 1 minus 1 over t squared. So the, the, the axis is logarithmic k? Uh, yeah, sorry, it's log, it's log ck versus log k. Okay. Yeah. Um, for those of you who really remembered the, the previous lecture, you might ask me the following question. Um, we saw last time that if I have a homogeneous kernel, that the uh, typical mass when the uh, homogeneity index was equal to 2, that the typical mass should blow up as 1 over 1 minus t. And now I have a different mass, 1 over 1 minus t squared. So how come I have different masses? And part of the reason I have different masses is that I have a power law distribution. And so if I were to compute the average mass, the total mass in the system, that should be something like the integral of kck integrated up to this upper limit. And so what is this? So this is the upper limit, k, c, k, which is k to the minus 5 halves, d, k. So this integral is like k to the minus 3 halves integrated, I get k to the minus 1 half. I get the upper limit, so this is like k star uh, to the power 1 half. And so even though the upper limit where the cutoff occurs is blowing up at like 1 over 1 minus t quantity squared, the total average mass contained in this distribution is of the order of 1 over 1 minus t. So that is the gelation time. So the thing is that you, you, know, you, you take your jello, you put it in your bowl, you mix it up, you put it in the fridge, and as time goes on, you're getting larger and larger clusters. And at t equals 1 in all of these units, magically an infinite cluster appears and uh, you have gelation. So what do you see that this solution for t larger than 1 uh, is unphysical? No, I mean, it's, it's not that it's unphysical. And, you know, this is very much like what happens in the classic percolation problem. So in classic percolation, at PC, there's an incipient infinite cluster. Below PC, you have only finite clusters. At PC, you have an incipient infinite cluster. Above PC, you have one cluster that contains a finite fraction of the total mass in the system, and all that's left is finite clusters. So the cluster size distribution is still well-defined for percolation both above PC and below PC. It's just that above PC, there's this one giant cluster that kind of has most of the mass, and you just have the rest in the finite clusters. And the same, exact same thing is happening here. Okay. Well, I started at two at two thirty, right? Okay. Okay. So um, that is the end of the story of um, aggregation. And now I want to turn to the next section of this class, which is irreversible adsorption kinetics. And um, the point here is that. Uh, once again, I'm going to try and argue to you that by taking a kinetic approach, one can solve a complicated configurational problem in an easy way by using, uh, you know, judiciously defined uh, master equations. So first of all, let me define what the problem is. So imagine you have a sticky substrate and molecules from above are impinging on the surface and whenever they land on the surface, they stick there forever. And then the question is, as time goes on, the surface is getting more and more covered. And how covered is the surface? So we're talking about irreversible 
adsorption. And let me um, just talk about this in one dimension. As, as I'm going to mention later on, the one dimensional case can be really solved completely. Uh, high dimensions, there's only like asymptotic results. And you know, in general, for a lot of these non-equilibrium processes, solving a one dimensional rate equation like a, a birth death, where there's a sort of a one dimensional basic variable like the location of a particle, the number of particles, the fraction of surface covered, these can all be solved exactly, but as soon as I add another spatial dimension, basically very little is known. But so the way I define the problem is I have a one-dimensional substrate, and so these little holes here are meant to represent adsorption sites. And so from above are molecules that, you know, they float around and they come in, and uh, they, when they hit one of these things, they adsorb forever. So in the case where we're talking about monomer adsorption, The problem is really easy to solve, and so let me just solve it because to give you a flavor of, of what the basic degrees of freedom are. So let me call V the de vacancy density. And so if particles are being uh, impinging at a fixed rate, um, so then V dot, so the density of vacancies, they go away with a rate proportional to V itself. So V is just equal to E to the minus T. And the coverage, so let's call rho the density, that's equal to 1 minus E to the minus T. So as T goes to infinity, the coverage goes to 1. So the surface is full. So there's nothing interesting to talk about in the case of monomer adsorption. But the first interesting case is suppose now instead of adsorbing monomers, you adsorb dimers. So you can think of these as rigid dumbbells. So I have something like this now. And it, it does something, it does whatever it does, but then it comes down and it occupies two nearest neighbor sites on the surface. Uh, but now you could imagine a situation where this, another dumbbell up here, then lands here. And now you've got this site here that's never has any chance of being filled. And so the interesting question to ask here is what is the coverage at infinite time? It's obviously less than one, but how much less than one? And uh, you can sort of get some idea of a bound on what it's going to be because the smallest the coverage can be is that if for every dumbbell there's a vacancy next to it, then the minimum coverage is two thirds. And the maximum coverage is one, but what is the coverage? And just from the point of view of history, it turns out that this problem was first solved by a polymer chemist named Paul Flory in 1939. And the solution is published in Journal of Chemical Physics. And if you're interested, it's worth reading it because it's only about a two page long paper, but it is such subtle and beautiful combinatoric analysis. And you know, when I read it, I think, yeah, 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 if I was twice as smart as I was, as I am, and I worked twice as hard as I did, yeah, I think I could figure out how to do this. And, you know, there's a very famous quote by Mark Kotz, a, a famous mathematician who died in the middle 80s, who described the difference between a genius and a magician. And so a genius is when somebody does a calculation, they look at it and say, yeah, 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 if I was twice or three times as smart as I was, and I worked three times as hard as I should, I could do this. But then a magician is someone, you look at what they did and you say, I have no idea how they did it. And uh, I've been privileged in my life to meet a few magicians. And when you meet a magician, you know it right away. And uh, I could reveal to you who I think my ma the magicians are for me. But anyways, let's go back to the problem of solving um, this irreversible absorption problem. So first thing we need to do is we've got to like define our basic variables. So at some intermediate stage of coverage, there'll be some sites that are occupied and some sites that are empty. And so, uh, there's one basic variable that you might think of defining, and it's like what I would call the uh, vacancy density. So let me define it this way. Vm is the probability of having the following configuration. An occupied site, m empty sites in a row, an occupied site, 
and then I don't have to worry about anything outside of that. That seems to be like a very natural way to describe the state of the surface. So if we use that description, let's now try and compute the time evolution of the vacancy densities starting from an initially empty substrate. So initially, all the vacancy densities are one because the, the lattice has nobody in it. So all these probabilities for any length interval would be equal to one. And so let me try and write down a rate equation for the time evolution of Vm. So first point is that if I'm dropping down dimers, so I have like a, uh, you know, a parking spot of size m and we have a car of size 2. How many different ways can I drop a car somewhere inside of that parking space? And if I do that, then I kill this, this, de this vacancy of size m. And clearly, if I have a car of size 2, I could use the first two spots, the middle two spots, the last two spots. Basically, it's m minus 1 spots that I could put my car. And so there's a minus m minus 1 vm. So that would be the loss term. But then there's a gain term because I could have a much bigger vacancy and I could park somewhere in the middle of the vacancy. I guess it never happens in Italy to have lots of parking spots empty in a row. But if you did do that, then you would have plus a gain term. And so that would happen if I had um, a vacancy of size uh, uh, m plus 2, uh, let's, oh, I see, so let's do it like j plus 2 summation m equals j to infinity. So if, if I have uh, a parking spot which has, is this huge, then, you know, like, so if I have a big empty spot here, I could park my car here making something of size m, or I could park my car here making something of size m over here. So there's two different ways that I could drop a car into a huge empty area to create a gap of size m. And so there's going to be a 2 out in front. So uh, this is the rate equation for the vacancy density. And again, it has this generic uh, character of that there's a loss term and there's a gain term. And in fact, there's another way you can view this equation because what's happening is that you're taking a gap and you're cutting it into two pieces. And uh, so if you take a gap and you cut it into two, uh, you lose something. But if you take a really large gap and cut it into two, such a one of the smaller gaps is the size that you're looking for, m, then you gain. Um, and so in fact, you could use the same formulation to describe the kinetics of a fragmentation process, that you're just breaking material into smaller and smaller clusters. And in fact, uh, you know, I could give a chapter, which I'm not going to do, but I could give a chapter on fragmentation kinetics where this would be my starting point. But in the case of car parking density, this turns out to be not the right way to deal with the problem because, you know, I just arbitrarily introduced this quantity V sub n, the vacancy density, but it turns out there's another uh, quantity which is simpler, where, whose equations of motion are simpler in character. And so let me look instead at what I call the Empty interval density. Excuse so, me, before you proceed any further. Sure. Can I ask you like um, clarification on v, the quantity Vm? Yes. So it's a probability to have at least something like you, draw, you drew like with m vacancies? Right. Or, uh, exactly m vacancies. Exact m vacancies. But since you have like, imagine this long chain. Right. Then this is the probability to have one of these structures or no, so the thing is that, you know, I have my, my large infinite dimensional lattice. I just count the number of, suppose that M is 12. So I just count how many, how many parking spots of size 12 exist in my entire lattice divided by the size of the lattice. That would be V12. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, okay. Um, so let me now look at a different variable, which I'm going to call the empty interval density. And this is E sub m. And this is going to be the probability of the following configuration. It's m sites in a row that are empty. And then I, I put an x here for I don't care. So I imagine that I'm looking at my lattice with blinders that are of size m. And I say, do I see m empty sites in a row? 
And here, yes, so that adds one to EM. I move over by one. Do I see M empty sites in a row? And if the answer is yes, I add to E1. But if there's like a, a now, I, I, there's a car or a particle at this site at the edge, then it's, it, we don't contribute. But the crucial point here is that I don't pay attention to what's happening outside of this interval. And in so doing, as you're going to see, it actually makes uh, for a much easier description because notice that this rate equation is non-local because it involves M and all sizes bigger than M. And so it's a little bit harder to solve than if I have a local equation. So let's look at the rate equation for EM dot. So there's the same loss term as before, M minus 1 EM. But now the only other way that EM can evolve, I mean, again, notice that if I have blinders on, there's no way I can create from, from an EM, you know, a cluster, um, an empty interval of size M. If, it's, if I have an interval of size M, the only thing that can happen to it, it can disappear because I'm either parking in the interior or I'm parking at the edge. There's no way I can create, by looking with blinders of this size, an empty interval of size M. So how do I... Uh, also lose, I can, I can imagine that I have, um, you know, here's my, well, I guess, let's make it the same number of sites. So I have my M interval. And if this happens to be empty over here, and my car parks here, then that loses the, M, M, the empty interval of size M over here. And I could park the car at the right edge or at the left edge, so there's, again, two ways that I can park, but it's just EM plus 1. So it's much simpler because it's a local equation. And in fact, you'll see that it's, it's easily soluble. So is it a minus sign? Minus sign, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a minus, minus sign. sign. There's no way of yeah. there's no creation process here. So that's another feature that this is now a monotonic process, and so it's a little bit easier to deal with. Okay, so how do we solve this? Well, you know, you see that it kind of looks like, I don't know. You know, it's a first order equation. Uh, I could do the following thing. I could write EM dot plus M minus 1 EM is equal to minus 2 EM plus 1. And then, uh, then you say, well, let's write this as a total derivative. And so if I write this as EM E to the M minus 1 T dot so I multiply through by e to the m minus 1t, then this plus this is just the time derivative of this combination. So this is equal to minus 2 e to the m plus 1 e to the m minus 1t. So this combination of variables is going to be very handy throughout. So let's call this thing equal to phi. And so this is a function of time, you know, some function of time. And in fact, what this is doing in some sense is that it's separating out the time dependence from the m dependence. So by its definition, so phi is equal to e to the m, uh, e to the m minus 1 t. Or another, or if I just turn it around, I have e m is equal to phi of t, e to the minus m minus 1 t. So you see that e m, which depends on time, it's a two-variable function, and now we separate it into a function of time only, and then a function which involves uh, size only. And it turns out to be uh, very convenient. So anyways, um, I'm running out of space here, so let's go back over here. So we now have phi dot. So listen, yeah. so in the second process, uh, uh, so that involves uh, the probability that uh, the extra site is also empty, right? The probability what? Uh, in the in the process uh, in the second part, the two em plus one right. process. Right. That involves also the probability that the extra site uh, is also empty. That's right. That's why it's em plus one. So here, I, I uh, okay. in order to park in the middle of the interval, I just have to have m empty sites in a row. To park at the edge oh. of the interval, I need to have m plus 1 sites empty, but I don't okay. care about m plus 2 or m plus 3 or anything like that. Okay, so we have phi dot is equal to minus 2, and now let's rewrite this in terms of phi. So, you know, here's, this involves em plus 1, but em plus 1 is equal to phi 
e to the minus m t. Just, I just change m to m plus 1 here. And so on the right-hand side, I have 2 phi e to the minus m t. Uh, I just have e to the minus t. Yeah, yeah, ask away. Yeah, exactly. You don't care. So they can be empty or occupied. Exactly so. Yeah, you know, and once again, it's like you have to play with these variables for a while to, like, feel comfortable. Like, what really is the difference between these two variables? Yeah, but the... Right. Yeah, I'm just saying, you know, th what's inside of this time derivative, I'm just calling that equal to phi. No, 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 but phi depends on m, obviously, but if I turn it around, then em, so there's a part here which doesn't involve m. Okay, well, let's, let's go on, because, you see, let's go over here. Where's m? There's no m here. Let's, let, let, let me just, let me do one or two more steps, and hopefully you'll be convinced. So anyways, the point is that now we have to solve this equation. So this is log of phi dot is equal to minus 2 e to the minus t. So phi of t is equal to phi of 0. Well, actually, let's do log of phi of t minus phi of 0. Let's just do it slowly. So that's the, the time integral of this. So it's 2, the integral from 0 to t, e to the minus t dt. So that's equal to minus 2. So I integrate. Uh, so I get this. And then I'm going to change it around. So it's going to be 1 minus e to the minus t. So finally, phi of t is equal to e to the minus 2, 1 minus e to the minus t. So I'm almost done, because we've now found the function phi, and let's now compute the coverage. That's the thing that we really want, is what is the coverage? So first of all, we have, in fact, more than just phi. We have e m of t. So that's equal to e to the minus 2, 1 minus e to the minus t. Uh, e m times minus m minus 1 t. So this is the time dependent coverage of any empty interval of size m. So in particular, e 1 is just equal to e to the minus 2, 1 minus e to the minus t. e 1 is a probability that there's an empty interval of size 1. 1 minus it that quantity is a probability that there's a full interval of size 1. So the density, the coverage, rho of t, is nothing more than 1 minus e1 of t. This is equal to 1 minus e to the minus 2, 1 minus e to the minus t. So final result, rho at t equals infinity. We just plug t equals infinity. And so this goes away, and we have 1 minus e to the minus 2. That is the cool result that was first derived by Flory in 1939. And this number here is like 0.864 dot 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 something or other. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. I mean, I just, I love, every time I do this, I just, I'm always in awe just because it's so pretty. Um, <clears throat> so that is the final coverage, and as you see, it's somewhere between two-thirds and one, and it's sort of like halfway in between almost. Um, and so there is the coverage for uh, irreversible dimer absorption. Going back to Angelo's question, so uh, in the last two equations there, uh, so you use, uh, so phi in principle should also depend on m, right? So in the last equation, you should have uh, phi of uh, m plus 2. I'm sorry, I'm confused here. So, Yeah, so, so that is okay. It's a definition of phi. Right. So and I in just principle, turned, so this, I, didn't do is, any, I didn't do anything here yet. It, you didn't do anything. Right. But then when you uh, write the same equation for m equal to m plus 1, right. then the phi, if it depends on m, should okay. be a different function. Yeah, but so the there is, is an assumption that uh, phi does not depend on m. And I'm wondering where this comes from. I, 
I guess what I would say is that if I, you know, if I don't say anything about what fee is, I, I, don't, I haven't made any assumption yet. I just said, oh, I've just sort of regathered things. And I look at the equation of motion for fee. There's no M in it. I mean, there's no M, so. No, because the initial condition, I start with an empty lattice. So, so the initial condition is every, everybody is, is one. All empty interval sizes are one. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. But the other thing to emphasize here is that in addition to getting Flory's result, we have the concentration at any time. And so if you now go back and look at Flory's original paper and struggle through it, and it would take you, it would take the average person several days to struggle through all the details, I argue that, you know, one nice thing about doing the non-equilibrium formulation is that, you know, with semi-elementary methods, one can calculate the full time dependence and then the final coverage drops out as a corollary, whereas in Flory's calculation, one has to work very hard. So it's, it's kind of cool. Okay, so there's sort of, <clears throat> excuse me, there's two natural uh, extensions that we can think about here. Uh, one is what happens if you have longer molecules. And then the other one, which is maybe more relevant for Italy, is suppose that instead of having like discrete size molecules, you have like little Fiat Cinquecentos that are continuous trying to fit into a parking spot. So let's look at these two uh, extensions of this basic process. And um, the thing which is kind of cool, oh, I should mention one more thing about this, which is that now you can ask, how quickly does the coverage approach its limiting value? And it turns out that if you're dealing with discrete molecules impinging on the surface, the approach is exponential. But as soon as you have continuous size particles or, or continuous parking spaces, then the approach is power law. So actually, let me just do is one more corollary here. Let's look at rho of t. I actually want to do it the other way around. Rho of infinity minus rho of t. What is this? So um, this is 1 minus e to the minus 2, 1 minus e to the minus t, minus 1 minus e to the minus 2. So the 1's cancel. And so I have e to the minus 2 minus e to the minus 2, e to the 2, e to the minus t. And for a long time, I can expand this in a power series. So this is going to be e to the minus 2 minus e to the minus 2, 1. Uh, okay, so when t is large, this is a small quantity, so we can expand. So it's going to be 1 plus 2 e to the minus t. And so the leading 2 e to the minus 2 cancels, and we're going to get e to the minus 2 e to the minus 2, so that's some number, times e to the minus t. So the point is that the approach to the final density is exponential in time. Okay. So let's now extend this to uh, absorption of k-mers. And here, it's like everything follows exactly the same. Every, every step is more or less exactly the same, but it's just that it becomes like a little bit more tricky to try and keep track of the books. And uh, so, in fact, I'll refer to my notes because I always manage to get this messed up. Um, but if we're doing k absorption, there's uh, two possibilities. First of all, you can have um, uh, your parking spot bigger than the car or the parking spot smaller than the car. In the case of dimer adsorption, there's only one parking spot smaller than the car, and that was a single, a, a single empty site where nothing could happen. So we didn't really have to worry about that. But here, we actually do have to worry about uh, the different uh, sizes of, of parking spots. So let me just write down the equation, and then it's, it's and you're going to see it's going to very much parallel what we have for dimer adsorption. So EM is equal to minus m minus k plus 1 em minus 2 summation e 
m plus j, j equals 1 to k minus 1. And this equation is true for m uh, larger than or equal to k. So that means that the parking spot is big. And let me write down the equation for, uh, for, for k less than m, so it's small parking spots. And in fact, once we know uh, the equation for the first one, we can get the equation for the second one very simply because if we're trying to, so actually let me s explain this equation a bit more and then I'll write down the equation for the other guy. So let's understand like what are all these different terms here. So once again, this is where we're going to park in the middle of our parking spot. So for example, if my parking spot is size seven, for example, and my cars are size three. So my car could be here, it could be here, it could be here, here, or here. So the thing is that in principle, if a car parked in the very first spot, the tail was k minus m, but one more spot because you, you know the last car, the last, the end of the car is over here. So the end of the car could be here, 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 or here, which is just m minus k plus one. So that describes that term. Um, on the other hand, if I want to look at like sort of parking at the edge, well, um, you know, if my car is of size three, then the car could have parked here, or it could have parked here. And if it parks here, it's already like an interior parking event, so that doesn't happen. So if I have a size three, if this was, you know, a car of size three, there's two ways that I could park in an interval of, of which is big enough to accommodate, you know, that part of the car. And so that is the equation for uh, the gaps of size m when you're parking cars of, of discrete size k. Um, in the case where k is less than m, then all you have to do in some sense is you're just interchanging the role of gap and car. So when I was parking like a car in the middle of the gap, like this, for example, so in some sense I said, well, I have to fit my car inside the gap. If instead my gap is size three and my car is like a stretch limousine of size five, for example, then I just have to count the different ways that this gap fits in exactly inside the car. And all that means is just interchanging the role of K and M. So I can get the equation just by interchanging K and M. And so I'm going to have uh, K minus M plus one EK minus two integral J, integral summation, J equals one to M minus one E K plus J. And that turns out to be the equation of motion for the other case. And, um, uh, you know, I, if, you, if you spend like another half hour like sort of puzzling out all the different combinations with a lot of work, you'll get to the same thing. But just by interchanging the role of car and gap, it's, it's much easier to get the same answer. So now I'm going to solve the set of equations by exactly the same technique as I did for the case of dimer adsorption. So once again, let's look at, um, you know, th this set of equations. And again, we have like a similar structure. So let's write this as EM. Um, e to the M minus K plus one T. So I bring this to the left-hand side of the equation. And so if I multiply through by E to the M plus minus K plus one T, the left-hand side is exactly this. And on the right-hand side, we have um, uh, uh, on the right-hand side, then we have um, minus twice summation. And so it's going to look just similar to what we have here. So we're going to have E M plus J E to the M minus K plus one T. And once again, I'm going to call this thing phi. And so um, that says that EM is equal to phi E to the minus M minus K plus one T.
Okay. Okay, so um, let's, let's do something with this. So what we're going to have then is this equation. So on the left-hand side, we have phi dot. And on the right-hand side, we have is equal to minus 2. We have a summation, j equals 1 to k minus 1. And then we have e to the m. And so I'm going to write, so e to the m plus j is just phi. And then it's going to be e to the minus m plus j minus k plus 1t. And then I have this, uh, yeah, uh, I have, um, and I've, first I multiplied through by e to the m minus k plus 1t. So I have to multiply, so e to the m minus k plus 1. I'm sorry that my writing has gotten a bit slow, small here. Uh, okay, so the m's cancel, the k's cancel, the 1's cancel, and so finally I get a very simple equation. Phi dot is equal to minus 2 summation j equals 1 to k minus 1 um, phi e to the minus j t. I forgot a t here. So you see that it looks not so dis oh, ran out of blackboard space. I had a very similar looking equation for um, the case of dimer absorption. There's only one term in that series and then you could integrate it. So it's the same thing here. It's just that you've got j terms in the series rather than one term in the series. So we have log of phi dot is equal to minus 2 phi e to the, sorry, e to the minus jt. j equals 1 to k minus 1. So I integrate that and I'm going to get phi of t. Um, and again, using the initial condition that my system starts out empty. So phi of 0 is equal to 1. So we're going to have exp of minus 2. And then I'm going to have summation j equals 1 to k minus 1, 1 minus e to the minus jt over j. So we're like sort of 90% done. We have our phi function, and now we have to compute the coverage. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay. By the way, I feel I'm going very fast because, you know, there's nobody, you know, there's very few people in the classroom to say, wait a minute, what did you just do? So, you know, like in the peanut gallery, just please shout out a question. Anyways, uh, so now we have to compute the coverage. And so that's equal to rho of t, which you know is equal to 1 minus e of 1 of t. So um, we have to look then at um, <coughs> e of 1 and its equation of motion. So um, let's see, where is e of 1? So this is for big parkings. You know, I'm looking at this and I'm realizing dyslexia struck again. This is, you know, I wanted to have the two different limits. This is the same thing. So please excuse me. This is for m less than k. Sorry. Um, so anyways, so here's the equation of motion for small gaps. And in particular for E1, E1 dot is minus k e k. So look at the equation for E1 dot. So it's equal to minus K E K, which makes perfect sense. If I have a gap of size 1 and a car of size K, the car can park in any one of K places and cover a gap of size 1. And there's no p possibility of edge parking, so this term doesn't play any role. So this is the equation for, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the gaps of size 1. And so, um, you know, E1 of T is equal to minus the integral k 
pk of t dt from 0 up to t. And the density, rho, is just equal to 1 minus e1. And so this is equal to 1 minus k, the integral from 0 to t, um, ek of t dt. Um, but now ek, well, you, so, it, you know, it's now going to look a little bit funky because it's 1 minus k, integral from 0 to t. So ek is what? Uh, it's going to be phi. So ek is phi e to the minus t. So, so it's um, phi. So it's e to the minus t prime and then times phi. And phi is times exp of minus 2 summation j equals 1 to k minus 1 of 1 minus e to the j t prime over j. So that's the answer. So that is the, the coverage in the case of Kamer adsorption. So one thing about this type of problem is that you have double exponentials, so it always looks funky. And every time I see it, like I'm always scratching my head, like what does this mean? Where's the double exponential? But, you know, it's like a simple analytic function. And uh, what you can also show is that uh, in the limits of infinite uh, long time, that the approach to the final coverage is exponential time. And then you can numerically evaluate this integral for infinite time and get what the coverage is for each value of k. And so in the case of dimer adsorption, the final coverage was like, you know, 0.866. For trimers, it's a little bit smaller. For formers, it's a little bit smaller still. And if you go to the limit where k goes to infinity, which means that you have the continuous limit, then it can be solved again, and it's called the Renyi constant. And the asymptotic density is like some number like 0.747 something like that. So the last part of the story, which I'm not sure I'm going to finish, is let's now look at the absorption of cars. So um, this is like, um, you know, what I saw in Rome when I was there is that creative parking is everywhere and people are squeezing in cars in like every possible spot. And the point is that um, when you do that, then uh, there's a possibility that there's a car, if your car is of length 1, somewhere in the system is a car of length 1 plus epsilon. And so eventually that gets filled. And then, then there's a, car, a spot of size 1 plus epsilon over 2, and eventually that'll get filled. And because um, uh, there's that possibility of like just filling in a spot which is just infinitesimally longer than the car, the approach to the final state, instead of being exponential in time, is a power law in time. So let's now talk. Oh, I guess I don't want to erase this. Kamer absorption. So let's keep that here because I'll write parallel equations for car absorption. So car, and let me put this in quotes because they're one dimensional cars to begin with. And they can fit into any spot which is infinitesimally larger than the car to infinity. And so now the basic observables, so now let's replace EM, which is a, con a discrete variable, with EX of T. So this will be the probability that interval of length X is empty. But I don't care what's happening just outside. And again, that's just the simplest way to deal with the problem. And so now we want to write down exactly parallel equations for Kamer adsorption for car adsorption. And here, because fortunately I didn't erase the equations, so I can sort of like almost cheat by like looking at these equations to determine the equations of motion for car adsorption. So let's first of all look at dE of xt dt for the case where um, uh, the parking spots are ample in size. So x is bigger than 1. So I should say now, when I'm talking about car adsorption, I'm going to assume uh, length 1 cars. 
I can choose the length to be anything by rescaling length. So I'll choose my cars of length one, and so my parking spots have to be at least of size one to accommodate a car. So if the parking spot is one or bigger, then I can accommodate a car in two different ways. I can park inside the spot, or I can park like at the edge of the spot if the spot is actually a little bit bigger than, than, than one. So there are two terms here. There's minus x minus 1, ex. I hope that term is now kind of obvious because uh, if you have a car of length 1 and a spot of size x, then you know the car can sort of fit, the front end of the car could be right at the beginning or it could be a distance x minus 1 away from the beginning and that means the end of the car would be at the end of the parking spot. So there's x minus 1 places, you know, quote unquote places to put the front end of the car. Um, let me move this a little further to the right. And then there is minus 2, and then I, and now instead of a sum, I have an integral. So I have an integral from like um, uh, x to x plus 1, um, e, y, t, dy. Again, this is parking in the interior of the interval. This is parking at the edge of the interval, either on the left side or the right side. And now my parking space has to be at least between size x and x plus 1 in order that the car uh, can, you know, fit for one thing and that, that, the, that the end of the car actually impinges on the original parking spot of size x. And then there's a similar equation for uh, um, small parking spots x less than 1. And here all I have to do is just again interchange the role of x and 1. So here we have minus 1 minus x e 1t minus 2 x to x plus 1, I'm sorry, 1 to x plus 1, e, y, t, dy. And so again, we could do a careful enumeration of all the different configurations, but once you're used to it, all you just say is you interchange the role of car and empty interval, and you get uh, the equation in this case. So it's like now to solve these equations, we do exactly the same as before. So now I'm going to define, um, you, know, you know, let's bring over this thing onto the left-hand side of the equation. And so we're going to get um, e x t, e to the uh, x minus 1 t, the time derivative of all of this thing is equal to minus 2 x to x plus 1 e y t dy times uh, e to the x minus 1 t. So I'm calling what's inside of here, this is my function phi, and to turn it around, then that says that EXT is equal to phi e to the minus x minus 1 t. So notice that for x equals 1, uh, E1 t is just phi just a useful limit. So now, you know, everything is kind of the same as before, and I wish I had another panel, so let's see if I can squeeze this in somehow. Um, so, we have phi dot, so that's le this is the left-hand side, is equal to minus 2, and then I have the integral from x to x plus 1. So ey, so that's equal to phi, e to the minus y minus 1 t um, times e to the x minus 1 t dy. So this is equal to minus 2 integral from x to x plus 1. So the phi comes out. And then, uh, let's see, so I have plus t minus t, so that goes away. And then I have, um, let me put, leave stuff inside the integral that should be inside. So it's equal to minus 2 phi e to the xt, and then an integral from x to x plus 1 of e to the minus yt dy. And so this is equal to minus 2 phi e to the xt. And so when I integrate this thing, uh, I'll get minus, but then I'm going to put the lower limit first, so it'll be back to a plus sign. And so it's going to be e to the minus xt 
minus e to the minus x plus 1t. And when I integrate dy, there's a factor 1 over t. So let's put the 1 over t over here. And finally, I'm going to get minus 2 phi 1 minus e to the minus t over t. So that is my phi dot. And so now I want to compute uh, ex. Um, well, okay. So, you know, you can see now I'm almost at the solution. So let's just, let's just finish this. I guess I have time to do this. I didn't think I was going to get this far, so I'm a little worried that I've gone way too fast. So you can tell me afterwards if it's too fast for, for future lectures. Okay, so... Um, well, I'm trying to slow you down with stupid questions, but I hope the students will also help me. Okay, <laughs> okay. All right, anyways, um, where am I here? Okay, so, so now what I have here, so I have phi dot is equal to minus 2 phi uh, 1 minus e to the minus t over t. So uh, I'm going to have log phi dot is equal to minus 2 1 minus e to the minus t over t. Ugh. Terrible penmanship. I should flunk grade 2 again. Uh, t over t. And so what we're going to, so if we solve for that, we're going to get phi of t is equal to phi of 0, which is equal to 1. And then I'm going to have exp of minus 2, the integral of 1 minus e to the minus t prime over t prime dt prime from 0 to t. So that's phi of t. And so the last thing now is we want to compute the coverage. And so what is the coverage? Um, so let's look at the equation for, um, so what is the coverage? Yeah, so let's look at the equation for, um, let me just remind myself of this. Um, yeah, so what is rho of t, the coverage? Well, in order, if I look at the coverage, that means I've got to look at an infinitesimal region and say, well, is there a car parked there? So that's nothing more than 1 minus the probability that an infinitesimal region is empty. So this is E of 0 t. So we've got to compute E of 0 t. So that means back here, we have to look at this guy for uh, x equals to 0. So if x is equal to 0, we're going to have, um, so um, uh, I, I need another little piece of blackboard space here. So from the equations of motion, we're going to have dE 0 t dt. So that's equal to minus, um, so e0. So this term doesn't contribute and all we have here is for 0. So it's minus e1 of t. Minus e of 1 t. Sorry, Sid, can, yep. can't you take uh, e0 t from the last equation there? Which equation the, the, here? Yeah. No, because notice that what I was solving was this equation. This is for x bigger than 1. I didn't, I didn't touch oh, okay. this equation. So I've got, it's, a, it's a separate equation that I have to deal with. So anyways, um, yeah, I guess, I guess I'm going to have to erase something here. I don't need this anymore. So that says that um, E0t is equal to minus the integral from 0 up to t of E1 of t prime dt prime. And um, rho, which is 1 minus E0, is equal to 1 uh, minus E0. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit stuck here, but I, I, I didn't want to refer to my notes, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat and refer to my notes here because I have lost my train of thought. Um, yeah. And I think I did something terrible because I just erased what I wanted to point out. And so remember way back when 
that um, I found that phi, where is phi? Yeah, so you remember, ah, ah, I would like to read what's on the blackboard, but I erased it too well. Um, sorry about this, but I'm almost, I'm sort of two minutes from the very end here. So we had, let me try and remember what I had, because my notes are so brief, I can't even read them. Um, yeah, so I had EXT is equal to e to the minus x minus 1 t times phi. So in particular, e 1 t is just equal to phi, just by definition. So, um, okay. So this is equal to 1 minus, no, but I'm, I'm missing something, I'm missing something really trivial here and I'm just confusing myself. Zero. Oh yeah. Okay. I know what my problem is. Let's go back. Let's go back a step here. So if I integrate this equation, dE by dt is equal to minus e1. This is going to give me e of zero t minus e of zero and t equals zero. And so this is equal to minus that guy. But this thing is equal to 1. So I have E, okay, so now I, I have the right answer. E minus 1 is equal to minus the integral 0 to t, E1 of t prime dt prime. Um, and so we have, uh, so E0 is equal to 1 minus integral from 0 to t. And E1 is just nothing more than phi of t prime dt prime. Finally, and uh, 1 minus e naught is just the density. So we're going to have the density is equal to plus integral from 0 to t phi of t prime dt prime. Okay, so finally I have the answer. So finally the coverage is, is equal to the integral from 0 to t dt prime of exp and so it's going to look really kind of funky. So it's 2 integral from 0 to t prime, because we want phi at t prime, uh, 1 minus e to the t minus t double prime over t double prime dt double prime dt prime. So that's my answer. This is the final coverage. And in the limit where t goes to infinity, so I, I'm, I think I, I don't want to do this now because this is... Um, straightforward but tedious and I'll, I'll, I'll certainly do the wrong answer but in the limit as t goes to infinity this thing goes to a, a, a asymptotic value known as the Renyi constant which is like 0 0.747 dot 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 and it's called the Renyi constant because this problem was first solved in 1950 by Albert Renyi, the Renyi of the Erdos Renyi random graph, same guy did this solution and uh, what I'm going to show, I mean, you know, it's like I'm sort of three minutes away from finishing this topic, but I don't feel ready to do it right now. Uh, but it's just that we can also compute the approach to the asymptotic limit, and it turns out that it approaches the asymptotic limit as 1 over t, rather than exponential in time. So uh, for next time, um, I will finish this discussion. I'll also talk briefly about adsorption in higher dimensions, for which basically nothing is known exactly. However, um, one can get the asymptotic behavior and there's a very simple scaling argument or, or I wouldn't even call it scaling argument, it's sort of dimension, not even dimensional, like hand-waving argument that gives you the asymptotic approach uh, to the final coverage in higher dimensions and that's really the only known result there is. So that'll be uh, for next time. Okay, thank you. Do we have a question?